because I'll forget if I don't. Um, the recording does not get published to the public. It gets public. It will be sent to you um, if you're on this on this uh, broadcast with us. So uh, that's that's something. And then we always like to have everybody. Um, join in if they would like to. So uh, there is a chat area uh, and you can go to that chat area. You can hit the little down button or no, you can actually go to the bottom of the page and it says to everyone, you can type in a message there if you have a question or comment. Um, you are all muted or should be all muted at this point. That's just for during our sort of little presentation that we're gonna do. Once we have done our presentation, if you want to say something um, to us, you're welcome to do that. And so you can unmute yourself during that time. Oh good, I have some more people that have their, their uh, cam cameras on, that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and welcome, we're gonna go ahead and get started and um, so I'd like to welcome all of you to the Montessori Family Support Gathering tonight. We will be having Friday night meetings um, through the end of May. Please make sure you check on the Montessori Foundation website to be sure of the time because we're kind of playing a little bit with the times to see when most people can join us. So um, it's a bit of an experiment for us. So please make sure that you check on that. Um, we also post these things on Facebook. Uh, we have several different Facebook pages and groups. So you can also find it there. But I think, you know, for sure, if you go to the Montessori Foundation website, which is www.montessori.org, uh, you can find out what's going on. And there is a lot, by the way, um, during the week. And I forgot to say, I'm Lorna McGrath. And I am the director of the Montessori Family Alliance. So I welcome all of you. Several of my colleagues are here tonight. Um, Margot Garfield Anderson uh, works with us at the foundation and she's here to help monitor what's going on with this chat and things like that. I also have Christine Lowry, who is a wonderful person who helps us out a lot at the foundation um, doing many, many things. And she's going to follow the chat too, I think. Whoops, I've got somebody else that wants to come in. And then with me tonight, um, two other members of our task force, Tammy Willen, and she is from Massachusetts and runs a school up there, Montessori school there. Wyland, is that right? Maryland. Maryland? Maryland. Yeah. Darn, I thought you were from Massachusetts. We're close, Lorna. Uh, they both started with M A. M A. <laughs> I got two of the letters, so <laughs> that's pretty good. Anyway, Maryland, <laughs> and Tammy runs a school up there, and she um, is gonna be speaking tonight, and Jonathan Wolf, who normally is from Seattle, but today is from Florida. He's been with us for about a month in Florida, and Jonathan will also be speaking tonight. So, uh, my task force members, help me get us started uh, with talking about we're going to ask you as members, how, well, first of all, um, how many of you have been to a previous gathering like this? Any of you? Or are you all new? New. I see a lot of new heads nodding. Let's see. I'm going to say, Kelly, have you been to one before? Oh. Kelly is muted and she's trying to unmute herself. Uh, no, she doesn't have a mic, she yeah, says. Great. No, I'm good now. I do. Oh, okay. There you go. So I've done some of the other um, uh, options, but not this parenting group. Okay. So didn't well, know how to answer your question. <laughs> no, we're glad you're here. All right. All right. Well, um, we were wondering if you have been to one of our other groups if um, you have tried any of the different ideas that we have been uh, sharing with people. So I don't know, oh, that's funny. Well, such as uh, 
family meetings. Lorna did a couple sessions on family meetings and how important that is. Anybody have some good success with family meetings? Or some bad success with family meetings. <laughs> Wasn't going there, Lorna. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. <laughs> Another time. Um, and Christine did some on uh, balancing work and family, I think. So if you haven't had an opportunity to join us, what kinds of things have you been doing at home um, that have seemed to work for you and your family in terms of your children um, staying engaged in activities during the day, you being able to get your work done if you're working at home. Um, if anyone would like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Um, somebody is asking, it looks like Stephanie is asking, what is a family meeting? Aha. Oh, that's a, I did two workshops on that. So In 13 words or less, Lorna. Here's the short answer. The short <laughs> answer is that a family meeting is a meeting that the entire family attends once a week. It usually lasts about 15 or 20 minutes. And it's a way for all of the family members to come together as a group, no matter what age they are, by the way. And they get turns leading the meetings and um, you get to discuss if, they, if there are situations that you want to problem solve about, you get to do that. If you want to share what's coming up for you the next week so that your family can support you, you can do that. And it always ends with a fun thing. And whoever is facilitating the meeting, whether it's your four-year-old or whether it's your 16-year-old or whether it's you, you get to choose the uh, fun activity at the end of the meeting. And that is the short answer. I hope that helps, Stephanie. All right, well, I guess we will go ahead and get started. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, let's see if I can do that. All right, and share. All right, and beginning. All right, now um, I cannot see any of you except for Jonathan. I don't know why I can see you, John, but I can. <laughs> Sorry. Good looking, so that's good. Um, anyway, so you will have to tell me if you can see what's going on here. We don't see it full screen, Lorna. We see all your different PowerPoints on the side, and then the, the first first one. It's not full screen yet. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to stop that share, and I'm going to try something different because there's some weird thing going on, as you can tell. <laughs> All right, let's try this one. Share. All right, let's do that. Wait. Uh, screen sharing has stopped as shared window is closed. Well, how do we open it? Um, hmm. I'll try that again. Um, as you can tell, I'm not the... There we go. You got it. Do we? Yep. Mm -hmm. we'll oh. yep. Let's, let's see if it moves. Um, yeah. Oh, there. Did it move? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. I think we're ready now. The, um, the topic for tonight is helping children stay happy, healthy, and constructively engaged um, and there is actually a little subtitle that says, uh, during uncertain times. And Tammy and I and Jonathan will each talk for five minutes and then we'll open it up for discussion. So here we go. As you all know, children change as they grow and they change in lots of ways. Some of it is physical, as you can see from the little photo that's at the top, the little timeline of children. Um, they physically change over time. So I didn't put that in because tonight we're gonna to be talking more about uh, how they change in terms of their skills, about how they change in terms of their sensitivities and how they change in terms of their thinking. 
And so I'm going to try to make the screen go again. Let's see if we can. All right. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped one. So at each stage, we need to remember to, first of all, pay close attention to your child. I mean, really pay attention and watch what they are doing, what they seem to be interested in, um, what, what is going on for them. Secondly, think about what you've seen, what you've noticed about them. And then thirdly, ask engaging questions. And each of us will talk a little bit about that at the different stages. So we're going to start with toddlers and early childhood, and Tammy's going to lead us through that one. Thanks, Lorna. Um, Maria Montessori said that the goal of early childhood education should be to activate the child's own natural desire to learn. And so that's really what we're talking about tonight. In order to stay engaged, um, they have to um, activate that, that desire to learn. And so our question is, how can we facilitate this at home? Um, because we are all home now, how can we create an environment where they can learn naturally? And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that children have their own innate path towards healthy development, as stated by Maria Montessori. And as the child's adult guide in their world, um, we have to follow their personal path so that they can reach their full capacity to be capable, contributing members of society. So how do we do that? So with the youngest child, it's very important to start first with the prepared environment. Teachers in the Montessori classroom prepare the Montessori classroom, and you as a parent want to prepare the environment in your home. You want to have a little space in each room, especially if the child's young. Um, because they're going to need to be near you. So maybe in the kitchen where you spend lots of time, the living room, bedroom, office, a number of those spaces with a couple materials in each room. As you see here in a picture, you could have some crayons, some Legos, some puzzles, some books, age appropriate um, activities. And you want to watch and observe them in interacting with these materials. Be mindful not to interrupt. We really want to let them focus. We want them to work independently. And we want to promote the increased attention with these materials. Let them figure it out by themselves. Um, lastly, you want to change out the materials in that environment um, in Can order to... I'm sorry. There we go. That's okay. <laughs> change out the materials in that environment so that it continues to stimulate the child um, as you see that it's time to do that. Okay. So, oops, okay, oops, it takes a minute for it to go and I'm anxious. <laughs> That's okay. Remember that if your child's in a Montessori environment right now, that they work independently in the Montessori classroom on a daily basis, every day. So expect them to do it at home. Let them practice that skill at home also. And relax. As parents, we often are busy, 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 even more busy now with all our family in the house, but relax. You don't have to respond immediately. Remember that your child knows how to wait. They wait all the time in a Montessori classroom. They wait for the materials to return to the shelf. They wait for the teacher if she's talking. They wait for the sand, the shovel and the sandbox if it's being used. So they know how to wait. So let's let them continue to do that. Okay. Let's see. There we go. And, um, Remember not to ask them if they need help. Quite often, if we ask children, do you need help? What's our answer? Um, it's typically yes, right? So wait for them to ask for help. And when they do, ask yourself, can they do this on their own? Mm -hmm. And if your answer is yes, then let's let them figure it out. Let's let them do it naturally. Let's let them be engaged with what they're doing. And I would simply say to them, 
I have faith you can do this. Feel free to come find me and show me when it's done. You know, letting them know that they can do it on their own. And lastly, in order for children to be engaged, they like to feel important. Um, it's important to give them responsibilities. And it's an excellent way to allow them to learn naturally. It's the natural things we do around the house on a daily basis as parents. It'll probably help to see behavioral issues decrease as they're involved with what you're doing. As soon as a child can stand, they can help with the laundry. They can pull clothes out of the dryer and drop them into a basket. Two-year-olds can match the socks. Five and six-year-olds, they can start to do the laundry with training from you. Feeding a pet, setting the table, watering a plant, scrubbing a table. All of those are ways for the child to be engaged with you, to be engaged with the environment, and to feel important. And it gives them a natural tendency to wanna, want to contribute. So engage with your children in these types of activities. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. No, to Lorna. No, to Lorna, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am going to talk about the elementary years with you because some of you may have some elementary children. And one of the things that I wanted to take a look at first as we think about these children is, as I said in the beginning, they change. And so an elementary child is in a really different stage than the um, the early child, the toddlers in the early childhood that Tammy was just talking about. And they have certain things that they're very interested in and very, um, they get very excited about. And so I wanted to list those for you just in case you weren't really aware of some of these. We've, we've studied children over many, many, many years and we, this, these are common to elementary age children. Um, one, they are very interested in money. They haven't quite figured it out yet, but they are very interested in it. And they wanna know uh, what money can buy, how it gets earned, um, you know, how much do I need for this, that, or the other. Often elementary age children will be very interested in actually in coin collecting because they just like, they like to be involved with money in some way or other. And you'll often see that elementary children want to, want to begin to start their own little businesses. You know, the old lemonade stand that we all probably did when we were kids? We were probably elementary age when we did that because <laughs> we wanted to start a little business of our own. Um, so they can be involved in that kind of a thing or tag sales or other things. Now, right now, while we have social distancing, some of those kinds of activities are not gonna be appropriate, but we'll talk about what might be um, if your child were interested. Elementary children are also very focused on right and wrong. They're all about rules and about people following rules and they get upset when people don't follow rules. They love to make up games and make the rules for the game so they can be char in charge of setting the rules and making sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they're very, very much keyed into right and wrong. And some of you will think, oh man, that's why I always, I feel like they're always tattling on somebody. They're always telling me, oh, so-and-so isn't doing such and such. Well, it's not really tattling so much as they're trying to figure out you know, what, what are the boundaries? What are the rules? How do we, you know, how do we all fit into them? What happens when we don't follow the rules? Um, all of those kinds of things. Also at the elementary age, kids are really interested in tools and machines. They like to take things apart. They like to put them back together again. I'm really old and I remember a, a toy that we loved during elementary school. It was called an erector set. And it had these metal pieces and it had screws and wrenches and, and gears and all kinds of great stuff. And um, we would build all kinds of things. And I know that kids nowadays have different types of things, maybe even a similar thing to an erector set, or maybe that's still around, I don't know. Um, but they really like to do that. And so you may find that your child is really interested in those kinds of things right now. 
they also have vivid imaginations and their imagination is a little different than at the early childhood level. They, at the early childhood level, um, little children can imagine things that they've seen before. So sometimes they'll have a little tea party because they've seen their family at the breakfast table or the dinner table and they're eating and they have, you know, their, their coffee or their orange juice or whatever. And so often little children will pretend about um, a tea party or they'll pretend about school because school for them is concrete. They, they've, they've seen it, they've experienced it, they go home, they make Jonathan sit down with them at the little table and do his metal insects and then he moves along. Um, whereas elementary age children have vivid imaginations, but they can imagine abstract things. They can imagine, um, oh, I don't know, let's say they can think up a story about uh, being on a rocket ship going out into space. You know, they, they have this imagination that doesn't have to be grounded in the real world. Whereas an early childhood um, child would need to, to have that happening for them to imagine. So they have wonderful imaginations and, and you'll notice that with those children. Also at the elementary age, they love, love, love to be with their friends. And they get into these groups and sometimes we find it very annoying. However, Montessori figured that out and she did a lot with group process during the elementary years because she knew that elementary children love to be together, to think things through together, to do things together. Um, and so that's an important piece and that's what's hard now during social distancing. Um, so hopefully you're able to get your kids together virtually and maybe even work on a group process, but it would have to be in a virtual way, of course. Also elementary children are beginning to get a grasp on time a lot better than uh, the younger children. Time is a tough com concept, but here at the elementary age, they love to imagine about the past. So they use their imagination in conjunction with time. What was it like back then? They try to imagine what it will be like in the future. Uh, they're really keyed into that kind of thing. They also are figuring out that they are part of a human, of the human family, that there's a big world out there, that there are lots of people, and that people have different customs and cultures and music and ways of doing things. And it's important at this age to remember that because they're looking at things that are the same and different about people, it's also a time when they can become biased or prejudiced about different, different groups of people and different ideas that people have. So we, we wanna be conscious about that as the adults in their lives because they're very, um, they can be very highly influenced in ways that maybe wouldn't be what we would want for them. And lastly, they're very interested in how the world works. They want to know what's happening logically and in reality. Um, if they don't get to do sort of like science experiments and things like that, then they may get caught up in fantasy and um, never really get out of that stage. So when you're watching your children think about these kinds of things because these are the kinds of things that you may notice about your own child that they are interested in they're not necessarily interested in all of these things at the same time in fact probably not um, so as you're watching your children observing paying attention to them because you're trying to figure out what they are interested in act as if Act as if you are a fly on the wall. Just, just watch, just quietly pay attention to, to what your child says, what things attract them. Um, you don't have to intervene at all, just watch. You remember too that you're not invested in this, in whatever it is that they're interested in. So you don't have to 
get um, overly anxious if they're not doing exactly what you think they ought to be doing. Be open and detached. Just let them show you by what they say and do what they're interested in and then be interested in it too. So I wanted to give you a little scenario before we end this part of our little talk tonight. Um, this is just an example and it's a scenario. You all, you, any of you, this is anyone, knows that your child is creative and imaginative. This is not necessarily your child. Let's say, I know, instead of you, I know that my child is creative and, imag and imaginative. And I'm noticing recently that my child is interested in right and wrong, also interested in making money, wants to know how they can get some money, <laughs> and interested in the current world situation. So I've been observing, and these are the things that I've noticed about my child, and I also know a couple of things from before. So after I think about that for a while, I might ask my child, you know, John, I've been wondering about what you're feeling after hearing the news about the coronavirus and people's struggles. And then I just listen. And maybe John says, you know, yeah, I, I really feel bad that there's a lot, seems like there's a lot of people that don't have money for food. I saw in the news there were big lines of cars lining up to get food. And that doesn't seem right to me. That doesn't seem like that should be happening. Um, so then I might say, well, do you suppose there might be a way for you to help people who have no money to feed their families? So again, I'm just asking a question for the child to think about. And so John may think for a while, and he, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe somehow we could raise some money or maybe somehow we could get some food and, and give it to the food pantry. Oh, wow, those are great ideas. Um, let's think about that some more. Do you wanna work with me on that, uh, on that idea about seeing about getting some food for the food pantry? Or do you think that any of your friends might be interested in working with us on that project? So notice that I'm pulling in the things that my, I've noticed my child is interested in and is sensitive to. And I'm not telling the child what to do. I'm asking questions that hopefully will get my child thinking and that will appeal to some of these sensitivities that they have. So if you have an elementary child, pay attention and see what comes up. It should be very interesting, I think. Jonathan, the adolescent years. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> We're off and running. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to take a little different tact. If the preschool child needs help in being actively engaged in the home with their hands, what Tammy was talking about, and the elementary child needs to be actively engaged with their imagination and their high level intellect in the world and what's right and wrong in money, the adolescent is going to be engaged even during this time. The question is, are they engaged in a way that's emotionally safe, that's morally safe for them, and compared to those younger children, as we all know, because we've been through this ourselves, adolescents have a very rich inner life that's very complicated, complicated by hormonal energies, complicated by, you know, doubts about their identity or what their purpose is in life or why is there so much injustice and disease in the world. So the job of the parent and the teacher of an adolescent is to make sure that whatever they are doing, that they are moving in a positive emotional and social direction and not getting into sort of dark or difficult or devious spaces. So um, I'd like to really focus in on helping adolescents in this case maintain a high level of mental health during this period. Okay, Lorna. So Dr. Montessori talked about the spiritual preparation of the adult parent, teacher, guide, uh, caregiver, that it's really important that before we support, in this case, adolescents, we know what is going on inside ourselves. So I would say before we get in touch with our adolescent child, I need to get in touch with myself. 
And that would be maybe some of the following questions, especially at this time. So this is the adult asking themselves this question before engaging with the adolescent, perhaps about some issue or behavior that they've been noticing. So what am I really worried about here? What's the worst thing that could happen to my child? Or what is really frustrating me here? What am I disappointed or sad about? And then the really huge question here is, are these really feelings that are really about my child's behavior? Or am I superimposing some of my emotional baggage, either from my past or just my current personality on the child? It's incredibly important with adolescents that we learn to help ourselves separate out is this my stuff or is this my my teenager stuff because we really can't help the teenager if we're projecting or superimposing our stuff and then i think the hugest question on this page for me as a uh, a former father of adolescent girls or boys <laughs> is what do i really want for my child is it compliance or is it happiness and and health um we certainly want our, our children to be to comply to the rules of the family, the order of the family, rules of safety. But much more important is, you know, the teenagers need to know, I'm telling you this because I love you and I care for you and I want you to be happy and healthy. I'm not first trying to make you follow the rules. They need to understand the uh, intentionality behind that. Lauren, I think there was one other thing that got left off of this slide. Could you go back to that slide? Okay. Yeah, I think it just didn't get on there, um, which is the, the other question on this slide could be as a self-reflection, what do I want for my relationship with my child right now? Wow. You know, is it again, is it getting my kid to do the right thing or do I want to preserve trust with my teenager? Because sometimes we can do things, as you know, with teenagers when we get too pushy or too authoritative or too demeaning, where now we lose all communicative trust and then we've sort of lost any ability to share information at all. Yeah. Okay, okay Lorna. Okay. So, and, and both Tammy and Lorna spoke about this, all of Montessori education is based on observation and assessment of children's needs and tendencies, whether it's a toddler, preschooler, elementary child or adolescent, we first observe the child to see what needs tendencies, interests, learning styles they're exhibiting. And then we reflect, what did I learn about the needs of this child? And then certainly with adolescence, we inquire, we ask questions. Okay, Lorna. So the, the, the question for me here is, um, and I love this graphic, Lorna used it earlier in hers, are we asking the right questions in the right way at the right time? And so to me, again, the right questions comes up again. Am I asking questions which have an energy? I'm asking you this question because I love you and I care about you and I want the best for you and I want you to be safe. Or is the tone of the question, I want compliance. That just doesn't work with teenagers. And of course, we have to at times tell them, I'm sorry, this is the rules of our family. But if the energy is compliance and not I love you and care about you and want the best for you and want to keep you safe, we may well lose them. In the right, uh, I'm not, go Oops. back. Uh, I want I to do, in, in the right way is, do we ask it humbly, like, hey, I'm, I'm wondering about this and how you're feeling, or do we ask it like a police interrogation, you know, where were you Saturday night? So the right way is coming from a place of inquiry. I want to understand you. I'm not trying to check up on you. That doesn't work with adolescents either. And then the, the right time and place is something that is not in the heat of an emotional battle with an adolescent. That's simply a time for people to calm down. This is, hey, let's sit on the couch after dinner and talk about what happened earlier that upset both of us. It's gotta be a learning and, and intimate discussion time. It's not an emotions up time. Okay, Lorna. Okay. So, and I've mentioned this earlier, or I've implied this, what's the message behind every question we ask an adolescent, I think, implied in ev everything we're asking about, what the adolescent is thinking about, what they're doing, what they're going to do next, who they're, go who they're going to be talking to online is, I want to know, is it, is it, I want to know what you are doing? Is that really where we, what we want to start? Is it, I want to know what you are thinking or feeling? Is it, I want you to understand this? 
I want you to do this? Or again, is it this underlying energy of, I want you to know that I love you. I believe in you. I want the best for you. And I'm always here for you. And I would love to know what you were looking at online last night in your bedroom. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the compliance question, but the underlying energy, the sandwich before and after that technical question about the child's behavior has to be, and this is why I'm asking it. I'm not trying to spy on you. It's because I love you. Okay. And second to last slide here is, um, and I love to ask this of all, all program levels in Montessori education, including with teenagers and parenting, what's the operative pronoun in Montessori? Is it, you need to do it this way? We do it this way in our family, or here's how I've learned to do it in my life. With teenagers especially, and I think you can argue this with all age children, it's here's what I've learned about the universe. Here's what I learned about saying sorry when I've hurt somebody's feelings. Here's how I distress myself. It's offering it as an I message and allowing the teenager to check it out. Because if we offer it as you need to do it, or everybody in our family does it this way, you're going to probably or oftentimes get resistance. Okay, okay Lorna. And John has this wonderful way of ending things with, um, with things with quotes from the prophet uh, Kahil Jabron. So, John, will you read this one for us? I will. And, and um, I, I decided to share this because I think it applies to everything that Tammy and Lorna said beforehand. You know, we have to give our best to our children. But as Lorna, I think, mentioned, we also have to be detached. So in the prophet, mm -hmm. um, somebody asks the prophet, this mythical person who's giving spiritual counsel to a village before he goes back to his village, they say, speak to us of children. And the prophet says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. And I think having been a Montessori parent and a Montessori teacher, you know, we are, are emotionally invested in the welfare of our children. That's natural. But if we become with children, especially in a time of stress like this, over-invested, like you've got to do it my way, or I'm so worried about you, you have to do it this way, we're going to get resistance. We have to respect that we want children to listen to our wisdom and our experience, but we have to have a certain level of detachment. The child may find their own path up the mountain, which is different than our path. And I think that's what Gibran is saying here. And it's, it's very challenging for all of us parents to do that. It's our spiritual work. Thank you, Lorna. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tammy. I'm going to turn the screen back on so we can all see each other. Um, and this part is for you all to, to share uh, any ideas or thoughts that, you that occurred to you during the time that Tammy and John and I were talking, um, to ask any questions of any of us, including Christine and Margot. We're all here to help and to answer what we can. Um, uh, so, so we have about, ah, yikes. We have about ten, uh, 10 minutes, five minutes, six minutes. We've got six minutes left. Oh my gosh. Okay, so uh, is, is anybody, does anybody want to say anything, ask anything, have a comment? Share a story. Yeah, tell us a story. We love stories. <laughs> Anybody? Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, I'm interested in how many of you have children who are, let's say, between two and a half and six. And you can either um, raise your hand or on the bottom of the screen, there's a little reaction button. And if you click on that, there's a thumbs up that you can, <laughs> either way. Ah, I see a couple of thumbs up. So a few, a few of you. Or, okay. How many of you have um, elementary age, six to 12 year olds? Okay, a couple of hands going up. Teenagers? Ah, a couple uh, more hands going up. <laughs> so everyone is represented. That's right, Thank that's you. great. Well, I'm glad that we did it this way because sometimes I think 
uh, when we get to talking, especially as Montessorians, we tend to focus a lot on the um, early childhood uh, age, age group. And we wanted tonight's to be for, for all, they usually are, mostly the principles that we use in early childhood, you can also use in other ages. But we wanted you to really have a time where we focused on the different levels um, for those of you that have children at different levels. Lorna, we do have a question from yeah. Stephanie. Oh. Um, she says, my children are upper elementary and middle school. And she's wondering about allowing them to create their own learning and life journey right now while they're staying at home, Stephanie. Yeah. John, you want to take that one since we're talking about middle well, school? And up I, I think the, my experience as a parent and a, and a former Montessori guide is the older children get, the more they're aware of their own interests, passions, life purpose, pursuits that they love. So I think honoring, especially at a time when they're sort of cloistered and caught where they don't have their normal classroom enrichment experience, you know, getting in touch with really becoming aware of what they are interested in pursuing, researching, talking about. I think it's incredibly important because they're aware of it. And, and if we're good observers of elementary and older children, adolescents, we can see what they're fascinated by and we should, we should help them run with that as, as far as they can. And I would just I would, like I to would, add to that. Add, step. Oh, go ahead, Laura. That's okay. Um, you know, I, I know in school, if they were in school right now, many of the things at the elementary level, upper elementary, and then at middle school and high school, the teachers generally have a theme or a topic or a, you know, a category of, of things that they want the children to learn about, but they also allow the children to um, choose what they're most interested in a lot of times and work with other children who are interested in those things as well. So they get that group process thing going, plus they get to initiate their own, their own learning within a topic that the teacher kind of is, is guiding a bit. Um, and I think you can kind of do that at home uh, if, you, if you have resources for them, books and you know, other, other resources. They'll, they'll find things that they're interested in and uh, you can help them go with that. You know, got another one uh, from Lorna, Beth. Lorna, oh. real quickly on that one. Yeah. Uh, for ahead. those of you who have followed Lorna's pitch for weekly family meetings, that would be a perfect time with elementary and adolescents to say, let's go around in our family. What, what is something we're really fascinated by? What's a question of something that I would like to know about how the life, life or the universe runs? And adults would participate in this. Like, I'm wondering how the coronavirus really got started. And you invite everybody to share an inquiry and what comes out of the, the children's mouths is like, oh, they're interested in pursuing that. That could be a great topic for a family discussion and further learning pursuit of older children. Good idea, John. I see that. Bethany, uh, oh, go ahead. Bethany has a question. Uh, she says, my five-year-old daughter is missing the end of her third and last year of Montessori and is working through some big feelings, including being disconnected from friends and teachers she may not see again. Mm. Any thoughts on how to help navigate this? Mm. Yeah. I'll speak, Bethany, just for a bit because I have a son that's in his sixth grade year and finishing his last year of nine years at our school of the three different programs. And I'm right there understanding um, you and her and where she's coming from. Um, the ability for him still to connect with those friends in whatever way possible virtually. And I know that's a little harder for a five-year-old than a sixth grader, but I know that some of our kindergartners and first graders are still seeing each other. They're singing the Frozen song together on the computer. They're still making some of those connections. And I think that's what's important for her during this time. And then making sure that she continues with those connections even post Montessori would be my thoughts. Uh, Tammy, to piggyback on that, there are some Montessori schools 
uh, with their third year children, whether it's the kindergarten child or the child moving from the third level into the upper elementary or upper elementary into, into the adolescent program, uh, they've been having moving up ceremonies right online mm -hmm. in yeah. which, um, which the children in that classroom and the parents can celebrate the moving up and the graduation of those children. And it's done as an online community event with parents, teachers, and kids. It's something that if you're if your teachers and your head of school are interested, that might be a really nice way to create some closure. Yeah. Okay, uh, I see Stephanie wrote again. <laughs> um, I teach primary, so I have dual purpose here. Okay. I also want to help my students' parents have faith that their children's education will be okay. Mm -hmm. Luckily, our continuing kinders will uh, continue in our school building. We have an online event. We will send them letters. Hmm. Nice. nice. Yeah. That's great. Christine, were you going to say something earlier? Did we? Um, I honestly don't remember what it was, John, but, but thank you. But I did want to say to Bethany, I have an adult daughter um, who went to Montessori from the time she was toddler through as long as she could go. But um, one of her still very closest, dearest friends is a woman that was in her early childhood classroom. Wow. They were, yeah, they met each other when they were three. <laughs> All these years, yeah. So those connections are really important. Yeah. Um, we are, we, it's, it's after 9.15 at this point. I would like to just mention to you that we do have a, uh, Facebook, Facebook um, pages and groups out there, Montessori Family Alliance, Montessori Foundation, uh, also the Montessori website, www.montessori.org, has lots of information about um, different kinds of seminars like this for administrators, teachers, parents. We will be here again next Friday night. And I believe, everybody help me out with this, that it's going to be a panel discussion um and it's going to oh, man i got the title of it did we I have thought it? it was going to be just an open kind of an open session for people to, to ask questions and and, and and just we would all interact with each other okay so right? it, so it'll be very interactive <laughs> um and uh all of us that were here tonight from the foundation will be here uh next friday night at the same time so uh, please join us again. Have a good weekend. And thanks for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.